In this video, we describe characteristic points in phase diagrams. Let's take a very simple generic phase diagram for a substance like this one, where you have solid, liquid, and gas phases separated by the phase boundaries. Uh, again, this is just a simple one because many substances exhibit more than one solid phase, but we're not going to be considering that in this video. Right, so within this generic phase diagram, we have two characteristic points. We have this point, which we call the triple point, and uh, this point right here, which we call the critical point. All right, so we're going to describe each one in turn. This one uh, is very interesting in that uh, what you have there is a coexistence between three phases. Right? So again, notice that if you're here, you just have that the gas is a stable phase, there the liquid is, here the solid is. If you are at these lines, then you have a coexistence between two phases. So there's no one phase that is more stable than the other. You have that both phases are stable and therefore you have an equilibrium between them. But if you come to this uh, point right here, you have a confluence of two phase boundaries, uh, actually three phase boundaries, and what that means is that you have a coexistence of three phases, right? What that means is that there's no one phase that is more, more stable than the others at that particular point. Instead, you have that the three phases uh, are equally stable and they are at equilibrium, right? Uh, a good way to visualize what the triple point is is to imagine a liquid that is freezing and boiling at the same time, right? That's where you have an equilibrium between solid liquid and gas. And, and these things can be seen. I am going to uh, link to a video uh, up here uh, so that you can see how uh, a triple point looks like. And again, that's something that happens for uh, all substances. Right, so uh, uh, now this triple point occurs at various conditions of pressure and temperature for each substance, right? So, so that's something that is kind of a fingerprint uh, of the substance. For example, for water, that triple point is at a quite low pressure of about, um, uh, you know, maybe about six milli atmospheres, right? So, so that's uh, quite low, and the temperature of the of that triple point is actually really close to the freezing point. So it's about two hundred seventy three point sixteen uh, Kelvin. Now, for a different substance like CO two, it turns that 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 triple point will occur at a pressure of about five atmospheres and the temperature will be much, much lower, 217 Kelvin. Okay, but again, that's, that's something that depends on its substance. All right, so that is the triple point. Let's now focus on uh, the critical point. And this is uh, a concept that we uh, saw uh, before, very early uh, in the semester, when we were looking at isotherms of gases and condensation. We talked about the critical point then. Okay, so here's your critical point. Right, so let's uh, try to see uh, what that means. Now, uh, this uh, critical point marks the end of the liquid to gas uh, phase battery, right? So this line does not continue at all conditions of uh, pressure and temperature. Instead, it actually ends up there abruptly. Okay, uh, the rest of the lines, actually this line, uh, does not finish, right? So that continues to go. Uh, the problem here is that you get to, you start to get to conditions of pressure and temperature that are really hard to handle. And it's not obvious how the phase diagrams go when you go to temperatures that are a few thousand Kelvin on pressures that are a few gigapascal, right? That is hard, hard to measure. Okay, but this is actually not. This is well known for a variety of substances, right? And we're gonna give some numbers for maybe water and CO2 later on. Okay, so what is the critical point? Our definition of the critical point um, before was that the critical point or the temperature of the critical point, which we have right here, okay, uh, that would be the critical temperature, is a temperature, uh, uh, is the lowest, uh, the highest temperature at which the liquid can exist, right? So, so let's see if we can say that again. If you are at a temperature above the critical temperature, then you, you will never observe the liquid no matter how high the pressure. Okay, so let's see if we can, again, talk a about that in a little bit more of detail. Suppose that you are at a temperature below the critical temperature, right? So right here, maybe right there. And you have 
a gas. I'm going to put this gas in a cylinder. Okay, and what I'm going to do, uh, this is your gas, is simply going to increase pressure, which means that I'm going to move upwards in this uh, phase diagram, right? So constant temperature, I'm going to increase the pressure. So what will eventually happen is that you will observe a condensation, all right? So once you get to a given pressure, which would be this pressure right here, right? So that pressure, right? what you would actually observe is that there's now an interface between the liquid and the gas, right? So that is the phenomenon of condensation. All right, so what happens when you're beyond the critical point, right? So if you're at the, at the temperature that is larger than that, same initial pressure, now you can repeat the experiment, right? But what happens is that in this particular case, you will apply pressure and you will never see this line uh, uh, separating the two phases between the liquid and the gas. So the liquid will never form, okay? Instead, what you get if you increase the pressure a lot is something that is called a super critical fluid, okay? So again, that's uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not a liquid, it's a super critical fluid. Right, so, so what is a supercritical fluid? Uh, perhaps a good way to visualize what a supercritical fluid is is simply a, a substance or, or a phase, a, a, a fluid phase, that has hybrid properties between those of a gas and those of a liquid. Okay, so what are the properties of the gas that are maintained in a supercritical fluid? Well, for one, the supercritical fluid occupies the entirety of the volume of the container, and that doesn't happen for a liquid, right? So that is really a property of a gas. All right, so what are properties of uh, liquids that supercritical fluids have? The density is really high, right? Notice that uh, if you increase the pressure sufficiently, it would be up, up here in this region. Those densities are actually much more characteristic uh, of, of a liquid than of a gas, right? So what you really have here is uh, um, a substance of fluid that is uh, as dense as a liquid, but it flows as nicely as, as easily as a gas. And that has really good applications. For example, supercritical fluids are extremely good solvents, and there's a whole industry trying to uh, uh, do chemistry using uh, supercritical fluids. CO2 is, is perhaps the, the most used supercritical fluid in the world because it has a very amenable uh, uh, critical point, right? So for CO2, the critical temperature is only 304 Kelvin, uh, which is about 88 Fahrenheit, right? So notice that you can actually get supercritical uh, CO2 for in a, in, a, in a reasonably hot summer day, right? 88 Fahrenheit. At that, at that, at that temperature, uh, or beyond that temperature, you would try to compress uh, CO2, you would actually never get it liquid. It would simply be a supercritical one. Now, the critical pressure for uh, for, of, for CO2 is also very amenable. It's about 73 atmospheres, right? So that means that it's really easy to get to this reading of the diagram where you have that supercritical fluid. Uh, for water, for example, uh, that it's very hard to get supercritical water because now the critical temperature goes all the way up to 647 Kelvin, and that means that it's really expensive to get supercritical, supercritical water. Okay, and then uh, uh, the critical pressure uh, for water is uh, uh, going to be also quite high, about 218 atmospheres, right? So 73 atmospheres is not, is not that bad to get. You, can, uh, you don't need uh, uh, a very special instrumentation to get it, but once you get to uh, a few hundred atmospheres, then that becomes a little bit more complicated. All right, so there's a lot of applications of supercritical CO2, of course. Uh, it's such good solvent that people have been using to decaffeinate, uh, for example, coffee or tea, right? So what you have is, is you simply pass uh, supercritical CO2 through your coffee beans or your tea leaves, and it's such a good solvent that it extracts the caffeine and it leaves behind uh, uh, the flavors and, and, uh, of coffee and tea with uh, a lot of the caffeine, right? And notice that CO2 is not toxic, so there's not going to be an uh, aftertaste in that uh, coffee or tea from CO2, right? So uh, that's, that's kind of an advantage. You could try to do the same thing with organic solvents, 
but then nobody would ever drink uh, that decaf coffee or decaf tea. Now, of course, there's many more applications for supercritical CO2. Uh, for example, uh, there's there's some startup companies that is trying to, uh, that are trying to do dry cleaning with supercritical CO2. Right now, we use solvents that are fairly environmentally not benign to do dry cleaning. But of course, for supercritical CO2, that's just fine. That's that's not a that's not a particularly nasty solvent at all, right? So all those things are taking place. All right, great. Uh, we're gonna wrap up this video by uh, talking about the usefulness of these characteristic points in defining some of the limits of the phases in a phase diagram. Notice that for a substance that is uh, that has a phase diagram like this, the triple point tells you what is the lowest possible temperature at which your liquid can exist, right? There's no liquid to the left, lower temperatures than the, the temperature of the triple point. At the same time, the critical point uh, sets the boundary for the maximum temperature at which you can observe the liquid, right? So uh, to the right of this critical point, there's no liquid phase anymore, okay? Now, uh, this phase boundary uh, or this limit for the, of the triple point for the liquid phase actually does not apply for water because water has a uh, line, uh, a solid liquid line that has a negative slope, right? So for water it's not true that the triple point determines the lowest temperature at which the liquid can exist, but mo for most other substances that is the case. Now, uh, one more limit that is useful about these characteristic points is that the triple point uh, determines the lowest pressure at which you will observe the liquid. Right, if you go to a pressure that is below the triple point, you will never observe the liquid there, and that happens for water and substances that are not water. Okay, so uh, in this video, we have described the characteristic points in phase diagrams. Uh, in the next video, we're actually going to move away from a qualitative explanation of phase diagrams, and we're going to get into the quantitative aspects of uh, the significance of these phase boundaries.